thanks for coming uh, to this year's Winter Park Book Festival in our virtual format. Um, this morning, we're going to start with our keynote address from Pamela Harris, who is a um, awesome author. She's recently published a book called When You Look Like Us, which is a YA novel about a boy who must take up the search for his sister when she goes missing um, in a neighborhood where black girl disappearances are too often overlooked. So awesome, timely, very very cool book. Um, and we are so excited to have her. And of course, a thank you to Raquel Henry from Writers Atelier, who has helped put this entire event together. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the reins over to Pamela here and we are going to get started. So thanks for coming. All right. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Thank you so much. So I am so excited to kick off the Winter Park Library Book Festival this year especially when the, the focus is a topic that I'm quite passionate about, diversity and activism in literature. But I'm going to be honest, I'm more than a little nervous because, you know, I'm still in my debut year after all. I probably don't have any business being up here. But I started thinking about the keynote addresses that I've watched before when I was a student attendee at different writing and author and book conferences. And then I remembered that most of them began with some kind of inspirational quote. So I'm going to give that a shot. All right. You can't get better than Toni Morrison. And you can't get any better than this quote. I wrote my first novel because I wanted to read it. So I decided this is it. I'm going to shape my whole presentation around this one line. But the more I tried to write something surrounding this, the more stuck I got. Okay, so in my day job, I'm a counselor, and I'm a counselor educator. I train students to become counselors, and the key component of our journey to becoming a counselor is self-awareness and self-reflection, figuring out our quirks and our kinks, the things that make us tick, the things that tick us off, and the things that make us feel stuck. And so after watching the cursor of my PowerPoint blink and haunt me for minutes, and then hours, and then days, I started to do some soul searching. What of the words of the brilliant Toni Morrison inspired me? But it finally hit me. These words want my truth. When I started taking my writing seriously, I wrote the stories that others wanted to read. So let me back up. So this is me um, in all my cherubic glory. Um, my parents told me I was cute. My parents told me I was smart and that I was special. I mean, but I was their only child after all. They doted on me and they loved me so hard that sometimes I wanted to push them away. Not because I didn't love them back, but because I didn't really quite figure out how to love myself yet. My dad was a Marine until I was about 13 years old. We moved around quite a bit, sometimes to towns where I was like, one of maybe three black kids in the entire school. So while at home, I heard words like cute, special, smart, even beautiful. But at school, I heard words like dark, fat, too quiet, nappy. I'll never forget this day in PE, and I think I was probably in second grade. We were doing a mouth, a mouth. And this white boy, oh, and I think I hear echo, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So we were doing the mile run, and this white boy, who I thought was my friend at the time, ran up next to me because he wanted to tell me a joke. Do you know what sound my lawnmower makes, he asked me? Run, nigga, nigga, run. I didn't quite know what the N word meant, but for some reason it burned something deep inside of me. It didn't feel right. But my friend laughed, so I did too, even when it felt like I wasn't supposed to. But I wanted to fit in. But at least I had books to turn to. My parents read to me every single night. There was this children's book that for the life of me, I can't remember the title, but I remember how it made me feel. It was about a mom telling her daughter a bedtime story. 
each page with a different animal mom in her towel reading the same exact story. Something about my mom sitting on the bed reading a story about other moms reading to their children gave me a sense of security. I was safe at home with someone who loved me and the skin I was in. That story ignited my love for all stories. First, there was Green Eggs and Ham. I loved it because my name rhymed with one of the main characters. So I would read it as, I am Ham, Ham I am. I love to eat Green Eggs and Ham. I even made a story based on the pictures on the page because I couldn't quite read all the words yet. That was the beginning. Then I graduated to the world of Judy Bloom and Beverly Cleary, who I found out passed away a few days ago. So that just devastated me because she was so instrumental in my childhood. My teacher began reading tales of a fourth grade nothing and otherwise known as she was a great in class. Even though I sometimes dreaded going to school because I often felt other, knowing that my teacher was going to read more pages after lunch is what got me on that school bus. I had to know what was going to happen next with Peter Hatcher, his classmate Sheila Tubman, and his little brother Fudge. I became so engaged that I started checking out books myself at the library. I started asking my parents for money to go to the awesome Scholastic Book Fair. Um, Judy Bloom and Beverly Cleary told me how annoying little siblings to be since I never had any of my own. Amelia Bazilia gave me an inside peek into the world of a zany housekeeper. Miss Nelson is missing showed me that if you take advantage of your sweet teacher, you get paid a visit by Miss Viola Swamp. I even started writing my own stories about the hygiene of regular little sisters and about substitute teachers, but my characters were always white. I mean, look at the covers of these books. Aside from the weird and sometimes problematic creatures in the Dr. Seuss world, they all had something in common besides fun sibling rivalry. The characters that shaped my childhood were all white. So I figured that books of kids who looked like me didn't exist. The closest I got to seeing myself was Linda from Judy Boone's Blubber. She was a chubby girl who got teased a bit just like me. But that was probably the only thing that we had in common. But then I spotted a book at my beloved Scholastic Book Fair that made my jaw drop. Philip Paul likes me, I reckon maybe. The girl on this cover has beautiful brown skin, just like me. She wore her hair in flat, just like I did. She was even from the South and spoke of a bit of a droll which made me homesick for my family back in Virginia when my family was stationed all across the country in California. I was in love. I found a new literary heroine, and I carried her around everywhere with me until a white kid at school asked me why I always held on to the book with the ugly girl in the cover. So I retreated. I got older. I didn't read for fun as much as I used to outside of maybe Stephen King and B.C. Andrews. I mainly read what my school told me to read, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, All Quiet on the Western Front, The Scarlet Letter, Great Expectations. I wrote too. I always had at least a friend notebook on standby, but I only wrote about Black characters in the safety of my cousin's family. We each write a page of a story, wait for each other to finish, to read it out loud, and laugh or act questions or argue about our character's choices. It was our own little critique group before we knew what a critique group was. But it was the most fun I ever had while I was writing. Because my writing felt free, felt authentically Black. We wrote about the food we like to eat, shout out to the damn pudding and lasagna and fried chicken. We um, wrote about the music we like to listen to, that then we were all about TLC. We created characters' names without worrying whether someone was going to be able to pronounce them. But if I ever had to turn in anything creative in school, I made sure my characters were white, or I never made their ethnicity known. I lied to myself and insisted that I did this so that, you know, anyone could relate to my characters. The thing is, though, when you think about Western cultures like here in the United States, about Probably 90% of books are published by white authors and about white characters. 
So when race or ethnicity isn't addressed in the story, the reader's mind defaults to white. I realized that after submitting a short story to one of my first writing workshops when I was an undergrad in college, I was still the quiet student, even up through college. I was the one who blended in and sat at one of the middle seats in the classroom while my peers around me argued the merits of like Costa and Camus. My classmates had read my pages, but apparently didn't know who I was until my professor asked me to say words about my piece. Oh, my bad, one of my classmates had said after looking at me. I thought the characters were white. It had changed the context of their feedback. Instead of focusing on the craft, my classmates now began a discussion on what lessons they learned from my characters. Because you see, characters of color, <laughs> color couldn't just be in the story. Their purpose was usually to serve as some kind of stage to teach white folks something about life. That was never my intention. But I bit my tongue and I nodded along to the feedback, jotting down notes that I damn well knew I had no plan on incorporating into my revision. Fast forward to a few years later, I pursued writing in my spare time, and I was even you know, lucky enough to get a literary agent, but I also had to make a living. I became a middle school counselor because my school counselor in eighth grade was one of the only adults in my school to intentionally seek me out and remind me of my potential. I wanted to do the same for other kids when I grew up, and I fell in love with my students. I never had my own children during a time that I was a school counselor because I always joked that I had 700 of them. I started noticing a large number of my Black students were disproportionately placed in the reading intervention courses. And for some of you that are not familiar with that, you know, students would take their standard English, and if they weren't um, meeting certain standards and you know, benchmark testing, they also had to be placed in the supplemental reading course. So when I met with these students, it wasn't that they hated or that they even couldn't read most of the time. It was that nothing the teachers assigned appealed to them. So it became routine that the teachers would recommend diary of a wimpy kid or something from the Bluford series for my Black students who hated reading. So if you're not familiar with the Bluford series, it's set in this fictional inner city high school and spotlights different characters overcoming what was seen as common problems for inner city youth like bullying and abuse and potential gun violence. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with either series. If I, if I got my students to read, I thought it was great. But after they finished these books, they also wondered, is that it? Is <laughs> that the only book my school has that's engaging? Are the teachers kids that look like me? At the time, I felt like the biggest hypocrite. Here I was telling my Black students how amazing, how awesome um, they were, how they should lift up their voices, yet I wasn't brave enough to write stories about them or write stories for them. The stories that I too wanted and even needed to read when I was their age. I decided that it was stop, you know, time to stop being scared and to write stories about their experiences and my experiences as well. So at this point, I had about two or three close calls with manuscripts I had on submission, YA novels with white kids taking the lead. One of my manuscripts did particularly well with submission, and I had editors that were open to see a revision. So I thought, this is my chance. My main character was a nerdy teenage boy named Jonah who wants to become popular and fall in love with the girl of his dreams, all while coming to terms with his mom, who came out and started having her, her first girlfriend. Editors called the story funny and heartwarming. So I was like, this was the perfect landscape. During my revision, I made it obvious that my lead character was in fact black. I talked about his low cut face, his you know, dark brown skin, his observation of being one of the only black kids in his advanced classes, his mom's affinity for the notorious B.I.G. I tied it up a few plot holes that my agent and I felt that the story was strong enough to go back on submission. But instead of the warm reception that we had received before, we were met with rejection. Not the soft ones like during the last round of submissions, but some of them were pretty hard. Before, my main character was seen as quirky and nerdy and cute. Um, but um, now, since he was black, 
I have gotten feedback that considers me to be angry, obnoxious, rude. One editor's rejection was particularly scathing. She went on and on about how much she hated, and that was like all caps, Jonah. But she was the same editor who gave my first pages some of the most positive film responses at a writer's workshop that I attended where she was my instructor. She absolutely loved Jonah back then. Back when she had assumed that he was white. Once again, I retreated. I took a break from writing. In fact, I felt like I broke up with writing for a while. I focused on my school counseling job. I went back to school and I got my PhD in counselor education. I focused on life in academia since my dream of writing would never be realized. I was with my agent for almost a decade with no luck, but not from her lack of trying, for my own lack of trying. And then something happened. Two something happens actually. First, I started to see a wave of black authors writing about black characters with a diverse range of experiences. I read about black characters working through trauma, Black characters fighting for justice, Black characters falling in love, and I was in awe and inspired. Second, an editor reached out to my agent asking if she had any writers who would be a good fit to write a YA novel with a noir feel for featuring Black characters. My agent immediately bought me. You see, I was a huge fan of the TV series Veronica Mars and also the movie Brit starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Both were noir set in high school, and while both had diverse casts, they also made sure that the white characters were in the leading roles. So here's was my chance to feature a protagonist who looks like me and my student and combine it with a drama that I love. Even better, when I met with the editors to talk about this project, they asked the, uh, me to share my story about growing up in Virginia. I told them about living in public housing when I was in high school after my dad left the military, about my church-going grandma and how she was like a second mom to me, about being seen as a smart kid but not really sure what to do about that since I didn't have a lot of kids that looked like me in my classes, about how despite feeling other than school, I had always felt safe and love back in my hometown of Newport News, Virginia. This is it, the editor told me. This is the story. Write about the neighborhood you grew up in, the people who raised you, the people you love. And so, when you look like a born, I always describe it as a high school noir set in my former hood. It follows a high school student named Jay Murphy who sets out to find his missing sister since it seems like nobody else cares. And writing this novel was cathartic. It was like I had pulled out all my insecurities and fears and even pride about being Black and poured it all into Jay. It was one of the most honest stories I had ever written, and I think the reader thinks that. Um, I, I'm still to this day surprised by all the positive perception that it's been getting, um, including two-star reviews from Kirkus and the School Library Journal. I was able to be featured on the Shonda Land website, founded by the Shonda Rhimes, who created TV shows with beautifully flawed Black leads. Just yesterday, actually, I found out that Forbes magazine had listed it in the top 10 YA books to read in 2021 thus far, right alongside Concrete Road by Andy Talbot. So, back to the lovely Toni Morrison. She wrote her first novel because she wanted to read it. When You Look Like Us was my fifth, that's five, fifth manuscript to go through the submission process, yet it was the one that finally broke through. I think it's because before I wanted to mold my stories into a landscape where it could be easily accepted. And by doing that, my stories felt false and forced even. Now, though, I wrote my first published novel because I wanted others to read it too. I write for my former Black student. I write for my two Black children who are probably driving their godmom crazy upstairs as I do this presentation for you all. I write for anyone who loves to read a slice of the Black experience. Ultimately, though, I finally, finally write for me. And that, to me, is the foundation of literary activism. I had to find my voice first in order to start uplifting the voice of others. So now I can confidently say 
Read the words of Jason Reynolds and Angie Thomas and Nick Stone. Read the words of Nicola Yoon and Tiffany B. Jackson and E.B. Du Bois. Read the words of new voices like Elise Bryant and J.L. and Kristen D. Gow. And I hope reading their words inspire you to find your own, your own voice. Thank you. And I think at this time, if there's questions, you can ask me that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Cam. That's that was awesome. Um, and are there any questions in the chat from the audience? I don't see any. Um, of course, if oh, here's one just popping in. Um, okay, so this one says, "I love your quote. How do you walk the line of depicting the real life experiences of Black Americans without being stereotypical?" That, I love that question because actually when I was going through the process of writing when you look like that, I worried about that. But then I kind of, I want to reiterate that, you know, Black people were not monolithic. <laughs> There's all kinds of Black people and all kinds of Black experiences. And so even though this story that I'm writing is kind of reminiscent of my time in high school and public housing and, you know, the people that I loved in my community, I would want people to also understand that that's not all of the Black experience, it's just a slice of it. Um, so I kind of had to push that aside and realize that just because my story is speaking about the experience, I can't speak for all Black people. This is just my world and my words. Um, and so when I came to terms with that, you know, I kind of felt more free to kind of add in the quirks and all the things that, I, that came along with a lot of my characters that are featured in the novel. Awesome. Awesome. That and that is a great question. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions anybody has before we wrap it up? I have some questions for Pam too. If there's no, if there are no audience questions. Yep, I'm not seeing any other ones. So please. I'm gonna ask you, Pam. How can somebody become a literary activist if? let's say, you know, maybe they're just starting out, they're now starting to be aware of, you know, publishing in general, right? Because right now there's a whole movement with we need diverse books and um, how publishing is, you know, still very white, right? A lot of the published authors are white. Um, so how can... People with color experiences when they're white. <laughs> that too, that too, right? We need more own voices too. So... Um, but how could somebody in a ge more general sense start, you know, get started even in literary activism? Because, you know, and then I'll sort of give you a little bit of an example of what I'm referring to here. One of the reasons why I really wanted this festival to be about literary activism is because I see I, I keep seeing time and time again. Those organizations and, and even individuals who sort of just have like here's our writing conference. And like, here's the one panel. <laughs> that features the authors of color all in that one. <laughs> right there. And it's on diversity as well. You, you know what I mean? And I mean, fantastic if you, if you mean well, but that is not the definition of what we're talking about with literary activism, right? Um, so how can somebody get started? How can we all even be genuine about literary activism? I love that question, too. Um, when I think about literary, there's so many parallels to me with my, my writing world and my counseling world, because my counseling students ask me the same thing, and our bill is called Social Justice and Advocacy. And, you know, even that word activism, advocacy, both of them just seem so daunting and kind of beyond reach. And so what I kind of remind students, what I think kind of applies to writing is that you know, there's tears to your activism, to your advocacy. And I think um, intimate or kind of interpersonal, kind of like, you know, smaller setting activism can be just as important. So I would say, you know, if you're really, really passionate about this area, kind of put your money where your mouth is, buy Own Voices books. Um, preferably, if you're going to buy these books, buy from like um, minority-owned bookstores. And I would say, you know, leave reviews. That's critical. 
leave reviews for like authors of color and their story and make sure that you're actually recommending it. So to me, even that, even kind of like, you know, showing up and like, you know, showing up to the bookstore, showing up to the website to leave reviews, actually like, for you know, if you're on social media and sharing like, oh my gosh, I love this latest book from, you know, JL. <laughs> and I think this is great, you know, acknowledging it and letting people know where to find it, where they're like, go to the library to check it out. Um, adding books to the library list, you know, that, that may not be as well known from authors of color. I think to me, like, it seems like it's something very small. So if we have more and more people doing that, I think it can make a huge movement. So I would say start small, start that way first. I love that. Um, we had, so <laughs> I'm, on, <laughs> I'm on that app Clubhouse. And- I'm trying to get into that. I'm still trying to figure it out, but yeah. <laughs> I, it's definitely another time suck, but I have really enjoyed because I've been able to sort of just be a little bit of a fly on the wall and and sort of listen to conversations and hear what people are saying. And like, it's kind of cool. The cool part is that you have some big names that just sort of enter rooms. Like, you know, we were in a room the other day and just Jason Reynolds walked in uh, or came in. Um, So it's time I have tech so I can join. <laughs> oh, I will. I will. I will. Um, so it's been, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool app, but you know, one of the things that was brought up, there was an author who is not an author of color on there. And she was talking about, you know, is it the role of every single author to, um, you know, fight basically, you know, whiteness and white supremacy and things like that in in their work. And one of the things that I mentioned was that, like, there are so many different ways that you can be a literary activist, right? I'm not sure why we default to like, wow, I got to have this kind of character in in my work, even though I'm not, because even me, I would not go and write, like, there's a whole big thing right now with, um, you know, standing up for AAPI. So, Right now, I wouldn't say like let me put an Asian person in my <laughs> in my novel, right? And so like that's the furthest thing from my mind. Instead, you know, what I can do is elevate uh Asian voices and read their books and 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 review, like you said, you know. So I often think about that, like why we sort of just go straight to like, well, I gotta put I gotta write this kind of character in here, even though I have no idea. <laughs> And then, and to me, so if, even if you are, I think it's so so important to have a sensitivity reader too as well. Um, and like it's it's possibly even more than one because again, like I, I was a sensitivity reader for a, a person who wanted to write a book, and she did. I think it was, you know it was a published book, and there was one component that came from a black female perspective. It was like you know right at the very end. Um, and I appreciated that I had that opportunity, but I also hope, too, that the author made sure, because, again, that's just my experience. So I'm not the end-all, be-all of, like, Black life. So even if I found something to be problematic or if I found something to be okay, that's not to say that you, Raquel, would feel the exact same way as me, because it might have been something that I missed, too, as well. So, you know, I would say if you are, but make sure that it's authentic if you want to include them in your book. Make sure it's, like, you know, for a reason. Maybe it's a reflection of, like, your world that you're seeing, too. Mm-hmm. But you also want to make sure that you're being sensitive to how you're depicting them and that you're not falling into trope. And that's why I think making sure that you have some extra set of eyeballs on them is really critical. Yeah. Well, you know, somebody told me once, like, I, I don't even remember where this, like, because I've heard it multiple places, but I don't remember who the original person was. But I remember being at a conference and somebody asking that question, you know, like, can, you know, white authors tell people of color stories and I think like this is a good rule of thumb is to genuinely ask yourself why you are telling that story why you want to tell that story and if you are really the right person to tell that story because right now it's like no matter what and like people will probably disagree with me on this but no matter what like you're not going to be able to tell my story better than me I agree Could could you tell a good story Yeah, you probably could, but you won't be able to tell it better than me because I have actually lived like if you didn't live it, then, you know, there's there is going to be a degree of separation there. So um, 
it's, it's such an interesting conversation, but... Uh, you know, that reminded me, it was years ago when I was still, I don't even know if I was still querying or maybe I was still on the trenches, but there was an author and I had read their work and one of their characters was black and, they, you know, they weren't. And I was so frustrated at the depiction, but at the time, you know, no one was saying anything about it. And I'm like, because to me, it just didn't feel real. And it was just like, you know, if anything, the author kind of like, and I understand your attention. I'm doing this as a service because of the fact that these characters aren't seen enough. But I think the true service would be like, hey, I've already had a success in the publishing industry. I know that there are a lot of writers of color that, you know, are really trying to enter the field. Let me do something to kind of um, look up their voices. Let me acknowledge, like, if I read a really cool manuscript, then I'm going to say, hey, agent, look up for this one by so-and-so. And, you know, I think to me, that would have been better. And it's not to say, again, that, you know, white authors can never write a character of color or any kind of marginalized group. It's just that, for example, I'm kind of glad that this ended up being my first book, because you know what my first story was that I actually got my agent with. And to me, I can't imagine that being published because it wasn't my story to tell. It was it was a um, LGBTQ love story. And um, I feel like that there are so many great talent, you know, that can identify, you know, as LGBTQIA+, that it's their right to tell their story. So even though I was met with so much rejection, I think if anything, I'm like, thank goodness. Because, you know, I would have felt, felt wrong, even though it was something that I was passionate about. I consider myself an ally. It's still, you know, it wasn't my story. So I yeah. think, like, even if I told it in a different perspective with a different character and, you know, maybe their story is kind of in the, you know, part of it, but it's not really their story ultimately. And so I'm still grateful to this day. Because <laughs> there was a post of that book, but I'm so grateful that it never was published because, again, it wasn't my story to tell. Everything happens for a reason, right? <laughs> but um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up because that reminded me of something. Like we talked a little bit about this, um, and we have talked about it over the last, you know, few years that we've known each other. But um, you know, when I first started writing stories, and like you know, was in my MFA program, I did not write race into like I didn't I, I didn't have any kind of description, you know, of of the characters and. Um, like you and Key are the ones that brought it to my attention that like the default is white when you don't do that. Mm-hmm. And that like hit me like, like <laughs> right, right in the chest. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh. Like I, well, I don't want the default to be white either. Like I just wanted the character to feel, you know, relatable that word yeah, uh-huh. um, to, to everybody. Um, and it was that moment that, you know, I started really thinking about it and like starting to change and then, you know, the whole We Need Diverse Books movement happened. And at first I had, I mean, I, I really admit this, like I'm not, I am a little ashamed to admit it, but I, I, at first I wondered, like, I'm like, why, what's the big deal if, if somebody writes a different kind of character? Like what, you know, what's the big deal? And then I was on Goodreads and I came across a book about a Trinidadian character and the author was white. <gasps> and I immediately felt not even I hadn't even read the book, but I immediately felt well, what <laughs> should I write to tell my story? Here I am trying to get published and I haven't been able to, you know, break in, you know, my agent process was very long. Um and here, you know, somebody is telling a story about my culture. Yep. You know, they get to tell that story, but I don't. Um yep. and so I did, you know, sort of read, I read like the little excerpts you see. And it was not done well. And I remember like being... I know I read years ago. And I'm still mad I don't to pull it out yet. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's the thing. It's, I, I could have at least been like, well, okay, at least they kind of pulled the story right. But it was not done well. Like, you could tell it wasn't somebody who was Trinidadian, you know? And that, I remember that moment sort of just changing everything. And I said... I was, you know, I was writing that same novel, <laughs> YA novel that I've been working on for years. And I remember saying, like, I, I have to fix this. Like, I needed a story as a teen about a Trinidadian girl who suffered from an eating disorder and, like, had all the cultural um, battles as well with that. But um, I needed that story when I was a teen. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I look at it really honestly, like, I wanted that story and it doesn't exist. 
So I need to make sure that this is in here. I need to make sure that I do my due diligence even. Um, And then I need to look at what I'm doing with my work going forward. Mm -hmm. You know? And that and that's what you know. I said I wanted to be into even because I was met with that that was a slam that door when I started like okay you know what I'm going to make this character black I'm going to make it known that they're black because then I was kind of writing black people as supporting characters because I thought that that's what I was supposed to do and so when I turned the table and I'm like oh my god it's like <laughs> I can't believe like the reception that this is getting I mean he literally did the same as that thing when all the editors thought that he was white. But like it was just like the the flip, like it was a negative reframe. Like, okay, that seems weird coming from a black teenage boy. Like he shouldn't be doing those things. It's cute when this white teenage boy does it, but now it just seems really obnoxious. So um that was like my wake up call. Like I said, like I, I kind of went into my shell for a little bit, and, but you know, I still wrote in secret. But it was one of those things like, well, I guess the world isn't ready for that yet. So I'm glad that there are so many people now that are like keeping the door down. And what I love about some of those authors that I highlighted is that they still go out their way to make sure that they're like um, acknowledging the works of others. And I love that. And they're really amplifying um, marginalized voices all the time, but they're using their platforms for good, which is great. And which is something that I hope I can be able to do one day too as well. I think you just did that, Cam. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you just did that. So you are, and you are doing that because I've seen, you know, you've had some posts on Instagram. I've seen you talking about other writers' books and, and stuff like that. So you are already doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is um, a, a book besides your own, right, that you feel like you would have liked to have when you were a kid or a teen growing up? Do I know it? Yeah. We, we talked um, about well, wow, there's so many like like when we were at teens and stuff, there weren't that many options. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, I love Sweet Valley High. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot to, I left that one out. I read that too. <laughs> I loved Sweet Valley High. That was like my go-to. I also love the Babysitters Club. That was um, Martina, my cousin Martina. She loved them, and I and I borrowed some of her books. Yes. Yeah. So what I book? Probably, I, probably, I probably needed who I'm like up. Uh, Seth was now, and I know I would have loved her when I was a teenager. Is Tiffany D. Jackson because yeah. you know, I just I love, like she's just so like she's suspenseful. Her characters like I, I actually feel like I can hear them. Like you know, Monday's not coming. The way that those kids spoke in that book, I'm like, oh my god, just seemed like kids like that were in my neighborhood growing up. And mm-hmm. like I think that you know she keeps it engaged. She's a, you know like her she's a page turner. You know, so it kind of lets you know that we can feature these Black characters and their experiences in books that are highly engaging and it has, like, thriller elements and, you know, almost kind of all of silence. So, like, it's featuring, like, you know, Black characters. So I think, to me, that was exactly who I needed to read as a teen because I love R.L. Stein, but yeah. I didn't see people that look like me in the R.L. Stein world. So I think that would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> she is masterful with her craft. I mean... I, you you know how I gush and rave about Grown, like yeah. <laughs> which, which, you guys should read Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Um, that book, I mean, I I had been in a little bit of a reading slump, and I read all day for work, so it's it's hard also for me to get that like energy and time. Even though I love reading, it's hard to do it, you know, at the end of the day when you've been reading all day. Um, but, uh, and then when I say that, I mean, reading for fun, uh, but, uh, like her book kept me just turning pages. I mean, I was up till three in the morning and normally I can't really keep my eyes open. I usually fall asleep reading and I just, I could not put it down. And with like young kids, cause you know, I have like two kids under three. And it's like, I kind of value my sleep. So that, that lets me know in the book is good. When I'm like, okay, I can use this moment to sleep because my children are sleeping, but I can't put this book down. Right? <laughs> it's a sign for me. Like, okay, you're doing something right. <laughs> yeah, that's, to me, I'm like, that's how I know the book is like really good. Because yeah. I'm like, up, like turning the page. And I'm thinking about the book even after. Yeah. And I will say, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to be like, you know, because I am a little bit biased, but. That's also how I felt about your book because I think I read yours in like three days because I was, and that's fast for me, but um, (laughs) 
I read it in like three days because it's it was so well written. Um, and I just I wanted to know what happened to and it also that subject matter hits home for me, you know, with the missing children. So um just really great stuff. So <laughs> also I've been um blabbing here with Pam, just kind of keeping the conversation going because I know we had a little bit of time, but does anybody have questions, Anne? There is one more question. Um, Pam, what advice would you give to a young Black writer? God, uh, that, that makes me emotional because that was like me. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, definitely to have courage, be courageous. Because I didn't have that when I was um, a young Black writer. Again, like, I wrote about my experiences in secret because I didn't think anyone else cared outside of my family. Um, but, you know, I, I'm so glad, like I said, there's so many people, so many pioneers in this field that are knocking down doors that um, are is, is making it more accessible. We still have a lot of work to do. So, um, you know, just know that your voice matters, your words matter. Be courageous. Um, let others read your pages. It's okay. Because <laughs> I kind of like, you know, hold mine close to the chest. Like, I'm very protective of my words. But, um, you know, eventually, if this is something that you want to do, we have to kind of be used to that others are going to read it. So, you know, you know, turn things into your teachers, turn things into your friends, um, let your moms read stuff. Like, you know, just be courageous, write about your experience, and, you know, just go for it. That's all I often really say. It's, those are the words I needed to hear. It's have courage and speak up. I think that's awesome. That's like really good advice. <laughs> All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. So um, thank you so much for participating. This was really great. <laughs> I loved it. So much. This was like, I was terrified, but this ended up being really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This is a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, thank you for writing the book. <laughs> and um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and end this panel. And then the next one starts at 10. So hopefully I'll see some some people there too. I'll be there. <laughs> all right. Bye. 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 Bye.